You're listening to Tone Benders, the sound designer's podcast. Let's do this. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Tim Muirhead, and I will be your host for today. Today, we have a really great episode. We're going to talk about recording and designing sounds for underwater. It's a really hard thing to do. Nothing ever sounds like you expect it to when you put something underwater to record with. And we're going to kind of hash it out on what is the best ways to get the best out of underwater recording sessions and how to make it work in edits uh, to picture and such. Joining us today is Barry Donnelly, who's based in Cape Town, South Africa. He has over 120 IMDb credits to his name, including films like The Departed, Blood Diamond, Invictus, District 9. Those are all some of my favorite movies. That's awesome. He recently worked on My Octopus Teacher, which won the Best Documentary Oscar last year. It's a really cool film about a man who spends most of the film underwater, so he's perfect for the subject matter. Welcome to the show, Barry. Thanks, Tim. Kristen Quinn is an audio director at Polyart Games, currently working on Moss Book 2. She's been in the game industry for close to 16 years. She worked on games like Fear, Fable 2 and 3, Legends of Riterra, and Sunset Overdrive. Welcome to the show, Kristen. Yeah, thank you. Also joining us is Benoit Marcelo. He's been a sound designer for 10 years. He made his first five years in linear post-production in Paris, mainly animated TV shows, and since 2016 has been in game audio. He's currently working as a sound designer in Wild Sheep Studio in Montpellier on a game called Wild. And of course, he also co-founded Spec Travelers with Arno to record and edit sound banks for professionals. And also joining us is his partner, Arno Nobel, who worked 10 years in the video game industry as a sound designer and recently started a new position at Dontnod Montreal as lead sound designer and recently released a new quantum-based EMF recording set for Spec Travelers. But the reason that Arnaud and Benoit are here is because about two years ago, maybe, they released an amazing sound library called Submersion uh, that I got and I've used in a bunch of underwater scenes and has been super helpful. So I wanted to make sure they were on because the stuff that they uh, recorded slash designed has been really inspirational for me. So welcome to the show, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Hi, hey, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Hey, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So let's uh, get the gear question out of the way right now. Kristen, when you're recording underwater sounds, what gear do you use? Well, I've been using the Aquarian H2A hydrophones with a Mix Pre 6. That's my most recent sessions anyway. You have more than one of the hydrophones, right? Well, we've been a group of people in Seattle. We've been doing sessions together and we all bought one trying to like get quad setups and things like that. So just playing around and seeing what worked because we were kind of new to the underwater recording space. And did having more than one hydrophone do anything? Like, were you finding any kind of stereo spread or? Yeah, I, I definitely think we got more motion and movement um, using more than one. So I was pretty happy. I think we ended up kind of ditching the quad setup and was mostly focused on the stereo setup in the end. But yeah. Cool. So uh, Arnaud, Benoit, I don't know who wants to take this, but what equipment did you guys use to make your sound effects library for the most part? Uh, the same setup uh, as uh, Christian. So uh, H2A from uh, Aquarium uh, Audio uh, with the sound device. I don't know. Yes. Uh, when we made the sound bank, we used the uh, sound devices, uh, 702 and two uh, H2A Aquarium. Each of us uh, one and, and uh, that allow you to record in stereo. Okay. Barry, do you do a lot of underwater recording or are you mostly designing from source? I am doing recording, but mostly on top of water and treating it like underwater. Um, I find that that's the most successful for me. So I'm using 416s actually just with the Zoom um, H5 and then little Sony underwater handy cams, which we actually just place on the bottom and leave for a couple of hours and record ambiences and things like that. Oh, so the, like the onboard mic from the handy cams. Yeah, can get some great sounds from that, yeah. Because we can also just leave it there and just let it run until the card gets full. And when you say leave it there, where are you leaving it? On the ocean floor. So where we're diving in the kelp forest, we'll place it next to some rocks or where the octopus is or so where some sharks are and see what we get. So are you involved in pre-production and production then in order to do that? Or are you going after the fact? I'm going after the fact because my octopus teacher took about seven years to film. Well, seven years in the making, one year to film. It was just actually really was the life of the octopus. So I went afterwards and collected all the sounds. Once the edit was done, I knew exactly what I needed to collect. And in fact, collected them from the exact place where the film took place. That's really cool. So are these handy cams in stereo or are they mono or...? Uh, they're in stereo, little stereo mics on them. But I found the, the above water recordings 
but the most successful. And can you describe them a bit more? What, what are you doing above water? So actually swimming with all my gear in housing, um, also just from land-based recordings, from rocks and things like that. All the flipper sounds, all the snorkel sounds in the movie were all recorded in tidal pools right near the ocean, things like that, yeah. Cool. So Benoit and Arno, when you were doing yours, did you do any above water recording as well? or? No, no, no. All uh, the recordings in uh, the sunbanks is underwater only. And it's all actual underwater sounds? It wasn't any like synth design stuff or anything? No, only uh, raw recordings in underwater. Yeah. No things. So what were you doing in post to get the sounds to sound so thick and huge? <laughs> we use only our raw materials. We try to get a lot of different texture with uh, our two uh, H2A. And uh, after this, we try to use mainly pitch, uh, EQ, and a lot of compression with uh, isotope ozone. And we try to make impact with the reactor too. We use the S layer or uh, ensemble like uh, Droney to make uh, ambiences. And we experiment a lot with our sound. And when we find something interesting, we keep it and put it in the sound bank. So I guess th let's talk about the different kinds of underwater sounds there are. I guess the most famous underwater sound is the underwater ambience, which we all think of uh, as we're raised on cartoons and stuff to be a really kind of low underwater sound with some bubble movement and stuff. I also have Aquarian Audio H2A, and the first time I put it in water, I found that I wasn't getting that low sound at all. So what have the crew done here to kind of manufacture bubbles and stuff like that? Kristen, have you had any success with that? Yeah, I mean, I think the best recordings we ended up getting were dry ice because it turns into gas and it disperses a lot of air and, and movement. And we also found that like how large the chunks of dry ice was kind of mattered. And so we would actually grind up some of the dry ice. So it created a really thin kind of powder. So some of it would stay at the top surface and as other pieces dropped below the microphones. So we would just get all this movement from the dry ice creating a lot of air dispersion in the water. So describe this a little further. you are got the hydrophones in some kind of large bucket. How are you doing this? We tried a bunch of different containers. We tried like metal troughs. We tried above ground swimming pools. But the best result we found was actually a super large plastic. I think it had been used for commercial soy sauce container. <laughs> but like it was a giant plastic drum, basically. But I just found it didn't have any resonance, whereas I found with a lot of the other containers we were using, we were also picking up a little bit of the resonance of the, the container it was in. Yeah, I think resonance is a problem because everybody's first idea when they think they're going to record underwater is to fill up their tub at home. And then if you have a big metal tub, all of a sudden you're getting all this metal resonance with it as well. Has anyone else run into resonance issues? Barry, have you ever run into that? Yeah, so I find that the plastic actually works better as well, kind of big, big plastic tub. I've used those above ground um, plastic porta pools as well, which we set up in sound stages. Like a kid's pool, you mean? Um, no, bigger than that. Bigger than uh, that, so, okay. So yeah, one of those big full size, I don't know how many liters it holds, pools. Uh, we actually f filled it up in the sound stage and, and used that. Uh, so things like bubbles and things, it's for me, it falls down to Foley, you know? get it in the studio, the most quiet uh, location as possible and do it there rather than out in location because it's such a subtle sound. And what are you using to create the bubbles? Anything from straws through to chamois leathers through to uh, sieves, you know, that actually contain smaller bubbles and then you can release them all at once, one go. But the good old straw works wonders depending on the size of the bubbles you need, yeah. Sometimes it's just a large container which you can trap air in and turn it upside down for bigger bubbles. Uh, it all depends, yeah. Benoit Arnaud, how, how did you guys attack bubbles for your library? Uh, yeah, we record a lot of uh, bubble sound, like uh, Barry or Christian, with the bottle, pipe, or another thing. And uh, to talk about acoustic reverberation in the underwater sound is, to, for the first time, is really uh, surprising when you try to record in the tomb or something else. We have many reverberation, and uh, for us, the nice spot is calm uh, river. 
It's really, really impressive. Uh, the, the acoustic is uh, really uh, natural. So we record, sorry, a lot of sound uh, in uh, River and uh, we did uh, a lot of great uh, results for bubble sinks with bottle or something else. So how deep was the river? Uh, I don't know, four, four meter tips. Oh, I just question. I'm always really curious how people are kind of like placing their microphones and getting their microphones to stay in particular places with underwater recordings I always found to be challenging, especially in a river. Arno, how'd you get it to stop the microphones from floating down the river on you? Not so deep for uh, us, I think. If I remember, it was uh, three years ago now. So I yes. think we plunged the hydrophones at something like one meter, I think. Yeah, from the surface. Yes. Yeah. And how are you holding it in place? Uh, <laughs> with the, I don't know the word for the... Ma uh, microphone stand? A microphone stand. We use the microphone stand and uh, put H2A on, on this and scratch the microphone on the stand and uh, only used uh, that. So was the microphone stand in the river as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you weren't like on a boat floating above or anything like that. It would be no. rusty, but, <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> Barry, do you have any uh, thoughts on how to keep things in place? Well, because I'm mostly studio based, it's a lot easier. So most of my recordings are in the real world are handheld, so I can move around. And then in the studio, it's obviously microphone stands too. just get it all nice and clean. Did you have to weigh down the handy cams that you're putting at the bottom of the ocean or they weighed enough to hold themselves in place? No, they actually weighed enough. Sometimes they'll get a bit washed away in the current, but uh, you can generally find them again. <laughs> did you lose any? <laughs> no, fortunately not. Uh, because I, I did it with Craig, who is the diver in my octopus teacher. So he knows that kelp forest like the back of his hand. So we could always find them. And he's an expert underwater tracker as well of animals. So we, we could track it if we lost it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So one problem that I've always had when I'm trying to record with hydrophones is cable noise. There's a new documentary that's available on the Apple streaming service. I don't know if anyone's seen, but it's called Fathom. And it's about scientific researchers who are tracking humpback whales and trying to, they're dropping speakers into the ocean and playing back humpback whale songs and seeing if they can start a conversation with the humpback whales. And one thing that they did, they go into it in this documentary, is they wrap the cable for the hydrophone in a thin rope a spiral going along the cable, and apparently that adds rigidity to it and makes it so it doesn't sway in the uh, currents as much to make noise of it moving around itself. That's something that I'd never encountered before, and I'm certainly going to try next time I'm using my hydrophone. Has anyone got any secrets like that on how to deal with cable noise? The aquarium is, is, the aquarium is very, very sensitive, so that was... Uh, not easy to place uh, everything in place uh, before recording and we just try to have something safe and that no one will touch the cable or the microphone uh, stand. And when it's in place, that's okay. That's worked for us, but uh, yeah, yeah, this is uh, not easy to, to handle. Yeah, sorry, we have not a secret uh, to give you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I, I don't think anyone really does, but I'm taking the pulse of the room. Kristen, have you had any problem with my cable noise? I mean, yes, but mostly just editing it out of my recording. So I haven't gotten clever with like how to solve for that yet, I think. So when everyone's recording, do you find you have better results moving things in the water around the microphone or moving the microphone itself through the waters? Kristen, have you tried both those techniques? We have. I think we found usually it was moving stuff around the microphone opposed to the microphone itself and trying to avoid hitting the microphone, too, because I think even like dry ice dropping can when it hits the microphone, it's pretty clanky. And we but we would just edit those spots out. Other than dry ice, what did you have success with moving around? Well, for me, most of my underwater recordings have been used for magic. So I'm trying to like just find more texture and things to use with magic source. And so we had pretty good success using compressed air canisters, like an office dust cleaner underwater. It created some like cool, unique textures and we can control like doing wish buys. That was kind of a different underwater source that wasn't just the typical bubbles, I felt like. Arnaud, Benoit, what, what did you guys have success with? I don't know if it's the same case with the other hydrophones, but we, as a Christian, uh, move things around the microphone because it's almost impossible to move the aquarium because it's very sensitive. It's a kind of contact mic 
and uh, even someone uh, walking near the microphone stand the aquarium uh, will record it so when it's in place we cannot really move it I think great success with the movement uh, water movement like a whoosh uh, like impact this is really really easy to have a great result uh, with the kind of, of manipulation you have to generate uh, bubbles around the microphone it's the most uh, efficient way to have yeah. a great sound uh, even if you move your arm close to the microphone and if your arm is underwater at the start and at the end the sound is not really interesting and that was more interesting to have your arms plunging in water and generate bubbles and you have a lot of really interesting uh, frequencies with these techniques. Yeah, has anybody had any success dropping things into the water while the hydrophone's underwater? I wouldn't say dropping per se, but heating things and putting it into the water I've had cool success with too. Like we superheated bricks and put them into the water and they kind of like scream with like the air escaping in the water and it sounds really, really cool. <laughs> Wow. So how did you heat the brick? On a propane grill for a really long time. And then we had like fireplace tools that we used to carry the brick and submerge it into the water. That's definitely something you don't want to do. Yeah, you don't want to drop that on the way to the to the water pits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely not. That's awesome. I'm going to have to try that one. Arnaud Benoit, have you had any success like that? Yes, we had a, um, a very interesting sound. We tried to eat a metal bar with a fire. Okay. And uh, when the bars were, uh, was uh, really, really hot, we tried to put it in water. And it was a really interesting sound. It was like a lot of uh, small screaming, like creatures, uh, living things, almost like uh, a lot of small uh, Nazgul from uh, Lord of the Rings. Oh, cool. The Nazgul from Lord of the Rings are terrifying. <laughs> So Barry, let's talk to you a bit. You have not only My Octopus Teacher, but you've worked on multiple other scuba diving documentaries. So you have a lot of uh, experience designing underwater movement, like editing it to picture. And that's something that I find really hard. As, as uh, was mentioned earlier, it's bubbles are what makes the sounds, but there's not always bubbles in the picture. So you're kind of faking it. What success have you had in designing sounds uh, to match kind of the movement, things that don't actually make noises underwater, but that we all have feel like we have to put in yeah i mean for me the water is kind of like doing ambience tracks with air it's just a movement of molecules so it's designing how the water reacts with objects around it so in a river example you'll have debris floating in the river and those little bits of debris will foley as they pass the mics in the ocean sounds it's obviously fish tails and shark fins and things like that which mainly the movement i find it's easier to record as a foley either in something like a tidal pool or in the foley stage. But it's creating exactly like you would create a sound world above water. The exact same principle applies below water uh, for me. It's to create an environment. So in the foley stage, you have a shot of a large fish passing the camera. What are you doing on the foley stage to make that sound? We'll experiment with as many different objects to get the sound that we want. Sometimes it's bits of leather that we're moving through the water. For smaller fish, it will be even just your finger. It completely depends on what the shot is. The nice thing is, as you say, you can see what the shot is and design it accordingly. It makes life a lot easier. And because it's such a controlled environment. You're recording overwater mics for these things on the Foley stage, right? Correct. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then do you EQ them in any way or pitch them? Yeah, so EQ, pitch it, blend it with the other recordings that I've done with underwater stuff to get it to match. Because as we know, the sound underwater is not what we imagine it to sound. It's a completely fictitious world, in effect. And what's your approach with EQing and pitching? It's generally pitch it down a couple of dBs um, and then a lot of rolling off on the high frequencies, getting the a nice full bass sound in there. And then sometimes a bit of reverb as well um, that I'll add to it just to give it a bit of space underwater, especially if you're in a cave environment. It would be a similar what I'd do in a cave above water, actually. It's all make-believe at the end of the day, isn't it? 
So I've never gone scuba diving, but if you're in a real underwater cave, does reverb exist? Like does reverb exist underwater like that? Like it's a, it's a trope we all know and we've all heard and it's immediately recognizable to us in a film, but I don't know how that tracks to reality at all. I'm assuming not. Well, you, yeah, you do get a bit of slapback. I mean, there's, uh, okay. yeah, the, the water and the molecules are moving around within the cave. So yeah, you do get that. Definitely. Yeah. Cool. I didn't know that. That's kind of blowing my mind. Okay. Kristen, when you are using, you, you mentioned you use most of these underwater sounds for magic. Tell us about your processing in post. A lot of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, magic to me is all about motion and movement. So I'm often just looking for looping textures so that you can create a whoosh by, you can create an impact if you have something that you can build the loop out of. And then if you need a looping source for projectile or something like that, you have it. So my go-to is just trying to keep create like long looping textures. A lot of the processing, though, to get some of the impacts or movement is similar tricks to, um, like, if I'm creating an impact, sometimes I'll do, like, side chain gate material with my looping source. You, like, can kind of get that tail without having to do a lot of editing, or I'm a huge fan of, you know, whoosh. I also really love the GRM Doppler tools because I feel like I can get a lot more subtle, softer motion rather than these really hyper big designed whoosh buys. A little bit of flange to get, you know, just really really a lot of processing to get interesting sounds and textures into the design. Now, within the context of the game, is there a water element to the magic or are you just finding cool sounds to go with what you're seeing? It depends. I think with magic, like my rule has been there are no rules. <laughs> so really whatever works and kind of builds unique texture, like especially with magic stuff, I do a lot of mouth sounds and things like that. But I think with the water content, like we had one of a guy in Legends of Runeterra that kind of did like blood magic stuff. So I used a lot of the underwater recordings for that. Has anybody else used recordings they made underwater for non-water-based picture elements as just source material? Yes, I already use our recording for the Sunbank for Magic 2 in a game and stuff like this because you can find really interesting texture in uh, underwater, I think. And yes, if you want something not too much aggressive, that can be a, a really interesting for Magic Sound. So, Benoit, what is your favorite thing you've ever recorded underwater? I think it's uh, what I uh, mentioned uh, before, the hot metal bar in the water, because it was probably the most surprising for yeah. us to the most unexpected uh, sound. And uh, Arnaud, what, what's your favorite? Don't pick that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, so I think a movement and whoosh will be really, really cool because uh, we can create a lot of movement. And uh, when we uh, try to design some creature movements uh, like whale or, or something else, I, uh, I try to, to design with uh, different uh, layering of uh, whooshes with the, like uh, Kristen, uh, with whoosh, with uh, S layer, etc. And, uh, and it, it's really cool to, uh, to create a big, big, big uh, creature uh, movement on, on the water. So for me, it's whoosh. Cool. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> what are you sorry about? <laughs> because it's not uh, original. No, it's totally original. It's, it's one of the most usable sounds that you can make underwater. It's definitely a good answer. Kristen, what's your favorite sound that you've ever recorded with underwater or designed for that matter? I think it would probably be the dry ice recording that I had mentioned where it, we ground up some of the dry ice. Doing different pieces of dry ice, I felt like it just created this really long, varied experience of an underwater recording just because certain pieces of the dry ice fell faster or later and then some stayed at the top. It just felt like this all-encompassing sound that um, felt larger than the other stuff we'd been doing during our hydrophone recordings. And how much dry ice did you use? Like, explain this a little further here for us. I would say on that recording, it was really just a handful because it was a happy accident of experimenting with it. And then we did another session where we realized that's all we wanted to do. Like it happened at the end of a session and we were like, oh, we should have been doing this the entire time. And so we scheduled another recording session to do it. And was the second one as successful or had you just captured some magic that you couldn't repeat? No, I, I think it's totally repeatable just knowing that like just getting the finely ground dry ice in the mix every time we were dumping some in. Cool. 
So Barry, I don't think I said in intro, congratulations on my octopus teacher winning the Oscar. That's so huge. That's amazing. Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, the little movie that could. It's interesting because every year, thousands probably, maybe tens of thousands of documentaries are made. And every year, somehow certain ones bubble to the top and get kind of the cultural zeitgeist and people are talking about. And that was one of them for the last year because its timing was also really strong because at least in North America, everybody got locked down and it came out not too long after that. So everybody was in their house looking for something to do and oh, this amazing documentary and everybody that I know was talking about it for a couple of weeks. So congratulations, your work on it was obviously a big part of its success. So what was your favorite scene to work on in the film? I think just creating the environments was so much fun. Creating the kelp forest. So it was basically taking a forest idea above ground, but putting it under the water. So we took buckets and buckets of kelp into the studio and we were crunched it up and we creaked it and we added it with the waves because it's also all mixed in surround. Every time we're passing one of those seaweed stems, it's actually moving from the front to the rear. So it was just creating this kind of a magical world in which the, the movie takes place. I found this very, very special area that is protected with a big piece of kelp forest because the forest itself actually dampens the swell. And the whole forest around there is absolutely murky and you can't see a thing. And in this little 200 meter patch, you can dive and observe. And it's an incredible place. I remember there was a strange shape to my left and just going down and seeing this really strange thing. And then suddenly... At the same time, trying to be realistic to the sound underwater, to, to put the viewer in that environment. In fact, I was told if I was going to work on this movie, I had to dive there and experience what it felt like before I even brought any of my gear or before I worked on the movie, which is great. Just to exist in the environment was fantastic. Cold, but good. <laughs> 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 so was it the director that insisted on this? Yes, yeah. I've done lots of movies with him. I've worked with him for about 20 years or so. So he always tries to get me to do crazy things, climbing cliffs, diving with crocodiles, swimming with sharks, you name it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. What sound experience did you have swimming with sharks? There was just mainly fear. There wasn't... <laughs> 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 weren't paying attention to the sounds yeah, at all, no, just trying to no, survive. No, really. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes yeah. perfect sense. <laughs> so you mentioned a second ago about how My Octopus Teacher, it's a surround mix, obviously. How do you go about building surround environments from the stereo handycam recordings you made? So I would use the quad, so the two stereos, one in the center, one in the, re in the rears. It wasn't actually mixed in Dolby Atmos, that was just in 5.1. And then using a lot of movement just to create that environment. So the more isolated sounds we can get to create that movement, the more effective it is in surround sound, uh, rather than just a general wash of waves or creaks or whatever. Um, it's the movement that's important. You were involved in the editorial and the mix, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. So what was the schedule like for that? It was actually quite short. I think I recorded only about four days on location of sounds, took it back to the studios, about five days of Foley, I think a couple of week track lay and a week mix. And that was it. Yeah, it was, it was quite a quick turnaround, yeah. And it was a one person mix? It was just you? Just me, yeah. Yeah, it was just me and the Foley artist and we, we did all the sound, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Congratulations, that's really great. Thank you. Arnaud Benoit, how long did you spend making your sound effects library? We start to record, and uh, when we close uh, the library, more, more than one year. Uh, yeah, more than one year. But uh, we, uh, uh, it is a side project, so we work uh, when uh, we have time. And I think yeah, one year half, I think. We 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 were both at uh, Ubisoft at this time. Yeah, on full time uh, contract. So we did that on the side uh, time and uh, on the weekend and uh, stuff like this. Yeah. What would you say the percentage of your time was between recording and then post-production? 
almost uh, 50-50, I think. We, we recorded a lot in uh, summer because it was more practice for us to... To, to, to go to the river. river. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to have uh, uh, hot water to record. I think we spent almost six months to record and almost six months to design uh, all the sound. But we decided to stop recording at a uh, time and just go to design for the rest of the time. We stopped recording at, at some time and just design. Fair enough. Well, it's a huge library and it's a really great sounding library. I encourage anyone out there to go check it out. It's available through a sound effect. Do you guys have your own website that you can buy it through or just a sound effect? Just a sound effect. Just a sound effect. And Sonis. And Sonis, yes. So I encourage everybody to go out and take a listen to that. Thank you. And obviously, if you haven't seen it, if you're one of the very few people who haven't seen My Octopus Teacher, it's available on Netflix and uh, it's joyous watch. As Barry said earlier, it's kind of like a, a magical underwater world that I didn't know anything about. And uh, it was a joy to sit through. And Kristen, thank you very much for joining us. I'm looking forward to the next game you're working on. Are you allowed to say what the game you're working on next is? or? Oh yeah, well, we just did a reveal of the Moss Book 2, so. And do you know when that's going to be coming out? can't say yet yeah okay fair enough fair enough so uh everyone listening keep an ear out for that in the future thank you for joining us today everybody i think this is a really great talk and i appreciate you spreading your expertise with us thank you very much yeah thank you so much thank you thank you thanks great thanks tim before we go i want to send out a massive thanks to linus macnes he's a sound designer based in vilnius lithuania who edited and mixed this episode for us Thank you so much, Linus. You are a lifesaver. Really appreciate it. Everybody, stay tuned to the Tonebenders feed. We have some of my all-time favorite shows coming out soon. I'm looking forward to letting you hear them. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you soon. Tonebenders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. 